Uh, hello, everyone. I don't know if you can, uh, hopefully you can hear me, but I'm um, just going to give give everybody a few more minutes um, before we start, just to give them a bit of time to, to log in. Phil, how long is the presentation for? Um, is this ten minutes? Twelve minutes? Ten minutes. Yes, yeah. so it's an hour and a half in total. Yeah, I'm, uh, ten minutes each. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we'll we'll make a start. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Can um, one of the panelists just acknowledge that they can see my presentation? Okay. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you for for attending this webinar, and thank you to to Bristol Housing Festival for for giving us this opportunity to to present to you today. Um, first of all, I just want to make you all aware that this session is being recorded. Um, and will be uh, hopefully published on where well, we publish on the Bristol Housing Festival YouTube channel and the various other YouTube channels. Um, so this is an hour and a half session. So myself uh, and a number of guest speakers will be discussing matters around meeting urgent housing needs and sharing experience of how procurement is supporting MMC housing delivery in the Southwest. So my name is Phil Blackmore. Um, I'm the Regional Procurement Manager at Southwest Procurement Alliance. I uh, joined in December last year. Uh, I've worked in a procurement-related role in the public sector for the past 12 years. I've worked uh, in healthcare, social housing, and now obviously at SWPA. Uh, these roles have, have always kind of centred around FM and construction, development, maintenance. Um, and previous to this, I was an estimator for a small building company in Plymouth for, for around five years. So I like to think I've got a, you know, a, quite a bit of experience and, and knowledge within procurement and, and the construction industry from, from both a client's perspective uh, and also from a, from a bidder's perspective. Um, just to, to go run through the agenda quickly, um, so just, I'll just give you a brief introduction to, to who we are at SWPA. Uh, and then I'll start. I'll start. To, um, I'll talk briefly about the different types of MMC procurement and delivery routes to market. I'll then, I'll then move on and discuss different types of housing solutions and examples of needs that can be met through MMC. We'll then hear from us three of our guest uh, speakers. So we'll, we've got Pat from from Agile Homes, um, who's recently applied for our low carbon offsite BPS, which I'll talk about in more detail later. Uh, we've got Laura from Roll Along and the Bansu from Z Pods, who are both established appointed companies on our NH2 framework. I'll then talk to you about some of the procurement barriers and for both clients and suppliers to the adoption of MMC and how SWPA, SWPA have helped remove these barriers with our two uh, current offsite MMC procurement solutions. This will let then lead me on to our final guest speaker, Laura Young from, from Wiltshire Council. She'll give a, a kind of client perspective on MMC and their journey to, to adoption. Um, and then I'll just I'll finish off briefly by talking about why engagement now is necessary and the benefits of, of early market engagement. Uh, and then hopefully we'll, we'll leave kind of 10, 15 minutes for, for some Q&A. So if I can kind of ask you to, to build up your questions, um, and we'll, we'll put them in the, in the chat. Uh, Q and A function, and then we'll we'll answer them at, at the end of the session if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so we are SWPA. We're part of a national organisation, LHC. For, you, for those who don't know, 
Uh, we deliver construction-related procurement solutions for public sector clients through frameworks and dynamic purchasing systems nationally uh, and through regional hubs, which SWPA um, are the Southwest hub of LHC. So through our frameworks and DPSs, MMC procurement can be delivered efficiently and at pace. Um, they remove the need to undertake costly consuming OGU tenders. There's a significant reduction in procurement time scales from six to nine months to potentially four to six weeks. Um, reduced procurement costs, uh, robust procurement solutions resulting from thorough professional due diligence. Ceiling prices that could be further reduced by competition at call off. And uh, most important for MNC and for inexperienced clients, we have solutions that, that meet every need. Uh, this slide just illustrates the, the different types of procurement procedures um, in blue at the top there, which kind of starts off with a, with a standard DPS with very little in terms of design standardization, but the choice of multiple suppliers and um, right up to a single supplier framework with standardized designs delivered by one or two suppliers. Um, later in today's session, I'll be talking to you about the, the three procurement uh, solutions circled in, in red there. So, MMC offers an opportunity to tackle many of the challenges the industry faces with regards to quality, skill shortages, net zero carbon, the climate crisis, and the increasing gap between housing supply and demand. Homes England have been delegated to oversee the delivery of the government's funding programmes. Um, however, even though there is growing interest in, in, in MMC, the initial take-up is still quite slow. And obviously with both the pandemic and Brexit, um, that's potentially made the labour and skills issues a lot worse as well. So MMC is finding early routes into the market via partnership working and procurement frameworks and DPSs, providing evidence that collaboration is a critical factor in making a success of building MMC homes. So all of our communities require a range of different house types and homes that best serve the people living, living there. We have had experience in offsite construction for a number of years, including affordable housing and supported accommodation schemes. We're also very fortunate to be involved in a number of incredible unique projects, um, including an award-winning development that made use of city space in Bristol, which Hope Rise. Um, this development built on city-owned council park, their uh, car park, shines a light on the opportunity to create similar community living spaces nationally and across the southwest. Um, new pod homes are a former industrial set at Cowling Mill, Cowling's Mill in Cornwall. That has move on accommodations to support homeless people without somewhere to live on their journey towards settled permanent homes. This development includes 10 one bedroom modular homes. So the existing housing crisis highlights not just the need for homes, but the need to deliver them quickly. We must also ensure quality and energy standards are met to help provide relief for current problems like fuel poverty and to meet future energy efficiency standards in light of the climate crisis. Procurement have a big role to play, making sure these standards are included in future tender processes and are fundamentally delivered. And now just to pass you on to, to the first of our three supplier guest speakers. So we've got uh, Pat Stewart from Agile Homes will start and then he'll pass on to, to Laura at Roll Along and then Debantu from Z Pod. So over to you, Pat. Can you see my screen, Phil? Yes, I can. Yeah, Pat. Yep. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, invitation to speak. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, Agile Homes uh, and what we do. Uh, and I could tell you all sorts about specification, performance, um, and, and, and the product itself. But I I'm not going to do that. Uh, that. That's for another time, if you like. Uh, what I am going to talk about is why we do what we do. And you've touched on some of that in, in your introduction, Phil, which is around uh, homelessness and uh, housing need and pace. Uh, so I I'm going to focus primarily on, on people and planet. Uh, really important, and I'm going to use one home uh, to uh, that we've delivered in in Torquay uh, to illustrate uh, our, our people-focused approach, uh, our, our social value, if you like. Um, so there are many stories associated with this, and, and some amazing uh, added value. I'm going to touch on some of that, and it's that approach that's led recently to Crisis UK, the homelessness char charity. Uh, investing in us as a business uh, and working with them to uh, try and end homelessness. So just 
um, I'm going to introduce you to a few people as I, I move through. And if I can make that work, that would be brilliant. Um, but first of all, a quick introduction to, to Agile. Uh, we're, we're a two-year-old uh, SME. Uh, but with a huge amount of experience in behind us, whether that's around uh, modular uh, housing or modular building delivery, low carbon, finance, project delivery, and so on. I won't, I won't go into that uh, in great detail. We're a triple bottom line business, but we, we put people and planet and, pro and profit at our bottom line. And we're not afraid to talk about profit, but primarily we talk about people and planet. And that's social purpose uh, around people-centred housing, uh, around building resilient communities is actually baked into our, our social purpose as a business. Um, uh, in a nutshell, we design, manufacture and deliver high quality, low carbon, safe and civil. That's really important to us, safe and civil, affordable homes um, for people in housing need. And we do that quickly and we use a panelised build system. We very rarely use volumetric. Others do that very well, uh, but we do sometimes. Uh, and we take projects from concept all the way through to turnkey. And I, I'll cover that a little bit in a minute. Our USPs are around, we get land for free. We're not a traditional developer. We don't buy land. We work with landowners to deliver homes for them. Uh, and we build with carbon. So our people-focused approach. Uh, I'm going to introduce you first uh, to Nuno, who uh, came to this country uh, from Portugal some 20 years ago. And unfortunately for him, he fell into some pretty bad company. So his experience uh, has been around uh, substance abuse, prison uh, and homelessness. Uh, we first met him under the Everyone In uh, campaign. Uh, he just moved into a hotel room, but he'd literally been uh, in a shed alongside a church hall um, next to a site that we were working on. Now, we were introduced to Nuno because we wanted to work with somebody uh, who had experienced homelessness, who had experienced uh, being in prison uh, to support us in, in terms of building uh, th this home that is in behind me here uh, at Torquay. We wanted to uh, help him get back on the rails, if you like. So we provided him that opportunity, that support, uh, and the support was primarily provided through a wonderful uh, local company in, in Torquay, uh, MW Benny, uh, who did a fantastic job in terms of working with, uh, with Nuno and his dog, Bella, actually. Uh, and he now, as a result of that, as a result of working with us and MW Benny for th three months, uh, he has a permanent job and a permanent home, which is not neither of those things he had before. So... It, we try and put people first wherever we are working, and that includes people who aren't necessarily going to be uh, uh, housed in the homes we produce, but that they are people that are working on them. So uh, I can't name this person, uh, for, and you'll see why that is in a minute. Um, uh, she uh, landed up in, in uh, Torbay as a single parent uh, with a four-week-old baby. Um, she'd been a victim of domestic abuse and had to leave home extremely quickly uh, and uh, found herself in un unsatisfactory accommodation. Uh, the council were working really closely with her, uh, and I'll introduce you to Tara in a minute. Tara was working very closely uh, with her. And she was the first occupant of the home that Nuno helped us build uh, here in Torquay. It was a perfect home for her. It is still a perfect home for her. It's, it's near local amenities, bus services, shops, and so on and has provided a really good start in life uh, for her baby, um, who's now uh, about five months old, probably just over. Um, now, uh, she's provided with wraparound support by the council, by the health service and so on, um, and uh, to help her become more independent. Uh, and as soon as that happens, uh, she's able to move on out of this accommodation, uh, uh, this home, and somebody else comes in. Now, that, from the council's perspective, is a fantastic invest-to-save model. It helps reduce costs. Uh, so our next guest in this room, if you like, you'll recognise her. Um, and th this is about a bit about planet, but it is about uh, building for our, our children and grandchildren, if you like. So not only do we build safe, civil, high quality, affordable homes, we also capture carbon in doing so. We build with natural materials, timber and straw uh, in particular. Um, and we also seek to reduce significantly um, operational carbon. So very uh, energy efficient uh, homes, helping reduce fuel poverty. They are super insulated, triple glazed always. We only use electric, we don't use gas, uh, and each home is PV enabled. Uh, and we build now to future home standards 2025. Uh, we comply with national space standards uh, and we, we only use brownfield sites, whether that's roofs, gaps, garages, car parks, you name it, uh, uh, we're, we're happy operating in those areas. 
and what's really valuable to us is about social impact. Um, it, it, we're around to do much more than just deliver homes. Uh, so uh, part of our model uh, is uh, working with offenders and ex-offenders, as, as I've said before. Uh, we're currently working uh, with uh, HMP Lay Hill uh, and their workshop there, and that's because the revolving door of, of re-offending in the UK costs £18 billion pounds, uh, a year. That's uh, £18 billion pounds for us as taxpayers. That's what it costs us. Uh, and it's crazy. When we got to hear about that, we were determined to get involved in, in trying to reduce re-offending. So what we do in HMP Lay Hill, uh, working with prisoners, is provide them with purposeful work, skills and qualifications in modern methods of construction, uh, and therefore a better chance of employment on release. Uh, and a better chance of getting themselves into rented accommodation. So many prisoners leave prison with £46 in their pockets and absolutely nowhere to live. Um, that, that, that's been so successful at Lay Hill that we're now looking at a distributed manufacturing um, uh, model across prison workshops in the UK. Uh, more to come in the future. And then just to uh, make sure that this is clearly understood, uh, we, uh, as I said, we, we have a panelised solution uh, made of timber and straw. You can see that very clearly illustrated on the left-hand side there. But that panel then has a choice when it leaves the workshop. Uh, sometimes those are commercial workshops, sometimes it's prison, but they can either go to very traditional looking homes uh, or they can go to very contemporary looking homes. It doesn't matter to us, uh, we can build either. Um, and uh, back on the people story, just an uh, introduction to Tara. She's the um, uh, Assistant Director for Community and Customer Services at Torbay Council. Um, she has a huge amount of responsibilities, but one of them is finding homes for people. Um, and there's a massive demand, as, as uh, Phil touched on earlier. And yet at the same time, there's a decreasing supply of emergency accommodation. Uh, and even putting people in emergency accommodation costs Tara uh, £2.3 million pounds, uh, per annum. That's a massive cost. So. Working with Tara, we identified the land that she could unlock, uh, public land. Uh, it's hidden in plain, plain sight, it's right alongside an NHS office building belonging to the council. Uh, there was a little bit of space there. We said, said she could put one home, one permanent home. Uh, and uh, she now knows, she can see the way in which she can deliver homes quickly uh, on land hidden in plain sight. And that home we delivered in, in Torbay um, very quickly uh, delivered a, a social value of one pound for every one pound spent on the home, uh, which is a fantastic result as far as we're concerned. And Torbay Council can see that as, as a fantastic model for them. And partnership is absolutely crit critical to us. Co-production is key, as it says here. So we work very closely with the Police and Crime Commissioner for Devon Cornwall Yards of Silly, Alison Hernandez. Her objective is, uh, you know, around mm -hmm keeping communities safe, reducing re-offending. So she was really keen to see how this concept of using uh, prison workshops to manufacture uh, our panels to use in our homes actually worked. So she was determined to uh, support that and has done so. Uh, in effect, she paid for the delivery of the uh, the TAM, one of our homes in Torquay. Uh, that cost £105,000 for a one bed, one person, national space compliant home. So she can see, and we can see, that that concept uh, of uh, delivery through prison workshops and reducing reoffending really works. And as I indicated just now, now's the time to scale up. And just to touch on the uh, point Phil raised, pace is really, really important. Um, so by and large, from point of order to point of uh, handing over the keys to any client, it takes around 24 weeks. It was half of that uh, before Brexit um, and uh, before the pandemic, uh, but we've had to account for a longer time frames in terms of some of the leading items. So it's now around 24 weeks. We try and do it in less. But importantly as well, we can put up the shell of a home and you can see that the top, top right hand corner of your screens there that that goes up in five hours so we can do that in an afternoon from delivery of parts to site to uh, completion of a shell in five hours it used to be five days it's now in five hours and finally just to emphasize a point a slightly different uh, example here placemaking is absolutely key to us uh, and working with a community as we did so here in uh, with the example of Emmaus Bristol right in the heart of the city center uh, creating a community on the rooftop of Emmaus Bristol's office space. Uh, we start what, what the community said to us and people who had previously experienced homelessness uh, said they wanted independence, but they also wanted connection with each other and with the community. So their independence is provided by the by the homes that we've designed uh, and will hopefully deliver late uh, next year. And uh, importantly, the connection is in the um, uh, spaces around those buildings, uh, in the courtyards around those buildings. 
Um, and we designed this actually around those courtyards. The homes didn't come first, the space for the people to connect came first. So uh, that's me and I can now hand over, I think it's to Laura, is that right, Phil? That's correct, yeah. Thanks Thanks for that, Pat. That was really, really interesting, actually. So, um, um, yeah, if anybody's got any questions questions for Pat, please um, please put it in the Q&A and we'll, we'll, we'll respond to them at the end of the session. But, yeah, over to Laura. Thank you. I'll just uh, get my presentation up. Can we see that okay? Yep, that's fine, Laura, yeah. And can you hear me loud and clear? You can indeed, yeah. Good, good. So thank you for having me. It's um, it's always good to reach a, a, a wider audience than what we are able to when we're all working from home currently or restricted to what we can do. So yeah, it's great. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to run through um, this presentation just to give you a feel for what Roll Along do, because I'm not sure the, uh, the name actually gives a, a great idea, indication of what it is that we do. Um, and then just to give an idea of how we've developed our, our product portfolio to meet current housing demands. So Roll Along specialise in the design, manufacture and construction of permanent buildings using off-site volumetric techniques as a primary method of delivering high quality homes. Now, the difference between uh, volumetric and panelized is that our product is essentially a box that's bolted together in, in the factory, whereas panelized systems may be delivered to site separately and then assembled on site. So I think that was one of the questions that cropped up in the chat. Um, another question uh, we were asked is MMC, so that uh, stands for Modern Methods of Construction, um, which does make me chuckle a little bit because the concept of, of what Roll Along have been doing has been going on for nearly 75 years. So it's not, um, it's not a new concept, it's something that's evolved drastically over, especially over the last sort of five to ten years really. So we're based here in Dorset. We have an 11 and a half acre manufacturing site. It's also our head office. We are uh, one of the South's largest offsite design and build modular contractor. And as I said, over 75 years of experience. The name Roll Along comes from the fact that we used to manufacture caravans. Being in Dorset, that makes a lot of sense, I imagine. Um, we, so our long history uh, stretches back to defence at MOD. We've delivered many sort of MOD assets over the years. Uh, residential, which we have been involved in for, gosh, some 20 years, but obviously we're seeing a massive incline in, in demand for that. Um, and education is a, a real mainstay of our business. So in terms of accreditation, um, we are ISO 9001, 14001. Uh, we have construction online membership and we are uh, have CHAS certification, which for any construction company, I'm sure you would expect to see the majority of those. Um, we are also BOPAS, so that's the building, uh, Build Offsite Property Assurance Scheme. So it's an assurance scheme specifically for the nature of, of what we do here at Roll Along and my um, my colleagues at Agile and uh, Zpods also. So we are NHBC registered and more recently we've uh, achieved accreditation for NHBC accepts. So that gives us a full system warranty um, for our sort of low rise housing. Um, it's something that's taken us a substantial amount of time to get to, um, but we're very proud of that achievement. So these are just copies of our, oh, sorry, went a bit too far there, copies of our certificates. So as part of our, as I mentioned, we've been sort of dabbling in residential for many years. As part of our product development over sort of recent years, we've partnered with a local housing authority to develop a range of uh, standard house types um, based on the portfolio that uh, they already had in their armory, uh, mainly around traditional build. 
Um, so we've taken those standards, uh, tried and tested house types and essentially modularized them to suit our volumetric system. Now this slide here gives you an idea of, although the, uh, the steel structure and the internal structure will be determined by our in-house design team, the look and feel of the products can actually be determined dependent on uh, the location of the site. It can be traditional, it can be modern, it can be in keeping with the local area for whatever is required. So just to give you an idea of how our modules, our houses fit together. So we take two modules to build up the ground floor. And then we put two modules together to build up the top floor. Now, the reason we do this is because we are in Dorset and we are don't have the luxury of uh, major motorways and A roads in abundance. And a lot of our delivery areas are quite difficult to access, especially if you have an extra wide or an extra long module that you want to install on site. So therefore we developed our range of products with this in mind, so that allows us to deliver to rural or urban areas, depending on the client's requirements, but it's kind of a catch-all scenario and to lessen the pain of the local residents as well. So this is our, I hope this works, Phil, please tell me if it doesn't. I can see it, Laura, but I can't hear any sound. Let's do anything. Yeah. Can So that was just a, some drone footage that we've recently taken um, for one of our sites in Sherbourne. Um, it's a so what you were seeing installed with three uh, terraced houses. And they will be. If you notice um, we had the external um, building paper in situ. And that's because the uh, modules are going to be rendered to be in keeping with the site that's there. So I just thought it was a good, gives you a good, for those of you that aren't familiar with MMC, it gives a good idea of, of what we do. So as part of our development to help meet the sort of urgent housing needs, and, and I'm sure you're all aware this changes frequently, um, demand dictates one thing, building regs say another and local plans will determine something else. So we've had to work swiftly and be agile and keep up with you know, what the market dictates and what our clients required. So as I mentioned, we've developed uh, 12 standard house types. So we call them house types, but this can be from uh, uh, one bed apartments, uh, three to four bed houses, two or three bedroom bungalows, uh, wheelchair access and M42, M43 compliant bungalows to your standard two bed, three person house. Um, so as uh, I think Pat mentioned earlier, we do build to future home standards. We're all electric. Uh, we incorporate the use of air source heat pumps as standard. And um, 
we do offer the option to upgrade because another thing that's sort of a buzzword at the moment is net carbon zero. Um, so we have the option to take our base model, future home standard, and upgrade with the addition of technology, including PV, MVHR, etc. So as I mentioned, we are M42 compliant, and I say M43 ready because, and Laura can probably vouch for me on this one, not always is there, although we recognize that there may be a potential need um, for an M43 property, at the time of placement of order, there isn't necessarily a tenant in mind. So the development as the product has, has been about really making sure that we future-proof our properties, that they can be adapted easily and swiftly to meet the needs of the local authorities. So when we say M43 ready, all of our electrical sockets will be you know, in the right places. We have uh, additional panels in the bathroom that bathrooms that can be removed to incorporate you know, wet room facilities, lifts, hoists. Um, and there is also the ability to adapt to the kitchen. So you have height adjustable worktops, hobs, etc. Um, and this is something that is fairly new in our development as we work with our clients and, and come across the, the ever-changing platform on which we're working. So originally our standard house types were built to 85% NDSS and that's in the last two to three years has quickly evolved to 100% NDSS as is required. As I mentioned previously, we have NHBC warranty. We also have uh, uh, a large manufacturing capacity and storage facility. Now, that storage facility has become rather key to what we're doing at the moment because as we come out of the pandemic, we've seen several delays in planning applications or delays on site that have been beyond anyone's control, um, but it's allowed us to continue to build the properties for our clients but then store them on site until that site is ready to be received. Um, and I think, as I say, that is more important than, than uh, anything else at the moment, to be honest. We've also developed a regional delivery solution, and that is in the shape of our smaller uh, modules that are more accessible, but we have also um, extended the uh, the rights for the standard house types across any other authority in the local region. Um, and the experience of this, Laura Young, as a, as a client, has sort of adapted um, the uh, standard house types and offering an off-the-peg off the kind of building property that hopefully has been pain-free. <laughs> So just another note, um, talking about the sort of regional delivery solutions and the, the modules, we offer a wide fronted home. Often we see um, sort of quite narrow tall buildings, but the wide fronted homes that we offer seem to be more aesthetically pleasing. Um, and, you know, we talked about, Pat talked about earlier social value. Um, we, we like the tagline of local homes built by local people. Um, and that's something that we really want to, to focus on moving forward. And that's all from me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer where I can. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think the kind of the Q&A function is working quite well at the minute because I think people are putting questions in and um, I think speakers okay, have uh, tended to kind of answer them as, as we're kind of going along. So, um, Brilliant. Um, so we'll, we'll try and we'll try and carry on doing that and, and try and answer them as, as a session goes on. But um some questions I might have to wait to the end, but yeah, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Um, Debansu, over to over to you. I think you're still on mute, Debansu. I think. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah, there you go. I was speaking to myself. Phil, is it okay? You can see my screen. I can. Yeah. 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 It's a typical Zoom. You speak to yourself sometimes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Right. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Devan Sudas. I'm the business development director for Z Pods. The picture you see here is right here in Bristol. 
which is an award-winning um, residential development developed in partnership with the, the Bristol City Council, um, the Bristol Housing Festival, and the YMCA. And you will be very pleased to know, and we are very proud that this particular modular project has been selected for the COP26 Built Environment Virtual Pavilion, the only modular project which has been, which will be showcased in the virtual pavilion world during uh, COP26 uh, seminar, which is happening next, uh, yeah, next month. So yeah, we are very much proud of what this award-winning project, and I'll let you see and uh, describe the project later on. So um, I think the, the main discussion of how to deliver more quality, uh, sustainable and affordable housing solution in pays. So I'll try to address those through our projects that we have uh, delivered uh, and delivering, as well as what are the learnings um, through that process. So who are Z-Pods? Yeah, if that's interesting. Doesn't go next. Change the slides. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so Zpods, we are also um, one of the SME, um, but we, as you can see, that we are one of the fastest growing SME. Um, our turnover uh, from a million, uh, we are will be hitting around twenty million plus uh, this year. So it's a fantastic job that we have obtained in the last couple of years. And that's because our product uh, has been developed in conjunction with the, the British uh, Research Establishment in Watford. I'm careful of the acronyms because a couple of questions coming up about the acronyms. So BRE stands for uh, um, so one of that. So we have developed this product with help of the, the, the professional body and uh, during 2016 to 2018, 19. So made the system available and it's, it's a proven build system. So with uh, uh, warranty assurance called BOPAS, uh, built offsite assurance scheme. And now we are working with Innovate UK on a post occupancy. So this system is basically in a nutshell is a very much proven, scrutinized and established product because we develop above a car park, which is our speciality and the USB. And furthermore, uh, our approach is towards net zero carbon long before the, this um, net zero uh, movement had started. So we approach our uh, modules with fabric first approach, which means make it as airtight as possible. And on top of that, we use renewables technologies like the solar panels to uh, minimize the energy consumption, which over the time period make it net zero carbon. Uh, our biggest difference with the rest of our um, friends here are, or in, in fact, quite a large number of uh, modular manufacturers are that we have an in-house big team of experienced design uh, architectural uh, people who therefore we are able to cater to starting from Reba stage zero to Reba stage seven, which means a full design to concept to a to planning, to actually fabrication, to completions. So a full turnkey solutions, which we are catering towards. Um, we are now engaged with over 18 public sector bodies, local authorities, housing associations, and working constantly with MHCLG and GLA, who is the, uh, the UK bodies of the housing sector. Um, our speciality is that we can bring forward various kinds of development side, whether it's a rooftop development, which is RTD, or a flood zone, uh, or a car park, or infills, and our sizes vary from 10 to 100. So uh, size is not a matter. Um, it can be anything. In fact, all the projects that I will show you later on are of various constraint sites with various difficulties. Um, so I'll show you one of our scheme, which is the um, how we build, and that will help you to understand of uh, affordable. This this particular uh, scheme. Have a look if I can see. It. That's interesting.
name is Sam and I'm a community builder here at Hope Rise, which is uh, the Z-Pod complex in Bristol, St George's Park. It's a beautiful, spacious, um, peaceful place to live and everybody that walks past is amazed and inspired about what can be done over a car park. <laughs> So that was Sam, who is basically a resident of that complex and uh, falls apart of the placemaking which Pat mentioned. So, and also describes how ZPods does, which Laura mentioned and, and, and explained that it's a volumetric way of um, construction process, which means we build it in offsite in the factory and bring it up to 90% completed. And then we can put it on, stay on, on a podium or on the ground, wherever the, the projects required and uh, we complete the site. So here are a couple of the projects. The top three are nearly complete. Well, the top, uh, the first two are have been completed. The first one is the key work accommodations completed during last lockdown. Phase one last year, uh, Hope Rise you just saw. The Bromley Council is a 25 unit scheme above a car park, which we are nearing completions. And the rest uh, two rows are all the pipelines from Maidstone to Newport to Ashford to Cornwall to Mid Devon. And the beauty of all of this are 90% um, uh, comes through the LHC um, framework, which is the swapper in, in the Southwest. And we are really pleased to have this collaborative effort working with the regional team of LHC. Uh, but and I really like the, the team of the swapper to, to work through the various schemes that we have on the ground. So yes, that is uh, that's is where we are right now in terms of our current project. This is the Bromley New Homes project, 25 units, 100% affordable, affordable net zero carbon. As you can see uh, from the site position from March to we will be nearing completions in end October, early November. So that the, the short, um, program time or the construction time leads to a sustainable development. So all these uh, projects that we're working on, and uh, mostly um, we start from the concept stage, which is the feasibility stage, to this completion stage. That has given us a lot of input to share with you in terms of what are the key things. I've just mentioned five key things, which uh, probably will be useful for you to understand. When I did a roundtable last year for Chart Institute of Housing, these are the key barriers that comes up uh, mostly in terms of the modern methods of uh, construction, so the MMC led development is, uh, as you can understand, lack of education, non understanding what are the various types of uh, systems. As you can, uh, as you have heard from Pat, they are on systemized or panelized, while we and Laura and Rolla Long are volumetric. There are engagement barriers, there are differences on sustainability agendas, and of course, there would be procurement issues and how to deal with that. So I'll cover a couple of them in my presentations. Uh, the first is first is what do you want to achieve? Um, we tend to differ from the rest of the lots of the MMC because uh, we don't believe in a cookie cutter approach rather than we start with the site, we have our design team, uh, we bring in what's called design for manufacturing principles and then work on what's the best uh, versions of the design that will be applicable for your site. With that, that becomes very much bespoke offering for you to, for public bodies to undertake the initial commercial evaluations. So those are quite the differentiations from us. That leaves us to a number of challenges of various kinds of land. So if you are at the first stage of MMC, I would suggest do your quick assessment of various sites, and then you can uh, probably use somebody like us to deliver uh, the prioritized sites as what are the options that you can deliver in terms of the massing study. So we will deliver a fit for purpose design and that's what we have been doing for all our clients. Um, next on sustainability, um, what do you want to achieve? Is it net zero carbon, is zero carbon, is passive housing, various sorts of floating ideas floats around. Based on your budget, that's I think the next stage is what kind of sustainable angle. Well, we are able to deliver net zero carbon. We are able 
to deliver uh, passive housing if required. In our uh, development process, um, we have catered to various requirements. We, as I said to before, we made the, 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 the fabric uh, our protest fabric first, which means the boxes as much as airtight as possible. Um, and then we, on the top of that, we use various renewables like um, we, we, our standards are triple glazed windows and doors, solar PVs, we use MBHR units, uh, which obviously optimizes the, the energy consumptions. So I think that's something that you need to work on as based on what's your ultimate achievements of the goal. Most of the clients that we are working on are working towards net zero carbon right now, uh, but at the same time comes with the commercial evaluations as up to how much and what budget they can go for. So that's a process of dialogue which we can engage with and, uh, we, and, and, and bring to you an optimized solution based on your requirements or a wish as far well as the commercial uh, allowance. The third stage is winning hearts and minds. As everybody has said, there is a huge perception gaps of um, modular methods, modular methods of construction. It comes from the prefab ages. But here we are, we have got a, a life size, um, as you can see over here, a full demo unit, which has moved around five times. Presently, right now, it's, it's in Cullumpton. Cullen Valley Leisure Center, um, where we are working with Mid Devon Council. Uh, it appeared in BBC recently as well. Over 400 people visited the unit and uh, have given their opinion. 99.9% uh, .9 has been very, very, very positive. So, winning hearts and minds is a very important aspect, the first step towards delivering your project. Um, there are other ways, uh, digital inclusions, uh, but I would say the most key learning from here is get engaged with your key stakeholders as early as possible. Fourth, of course, is the quality of the build. Most of us are BOPAS. Most of us have ISO 9001 manufacturing facility. So um, as you can see, this is actual pictures from the Bristol Hope Rise. Um, build quality is something that we can't compromise upon. Um, because that's where the reputation matters. And also our differentiation is that we use very high um, easy maintenance regime, uh, which uh, is very much durable. So for example, our timber uh, windows uh, last for 60 years. And on top of that, we have made it aluclad, which extends the design life by another 15 years, which means you can get up to 75 to 80 years of design life on maintenance. So those are the few things which we have built during the early development phases, which uh, makes things better for your project. And of course, our design has aspect, dual aspects. So enough of um, sunshine and all these things at the design stage, which we cater to. And finally, the procurement. Um, Procurement is an angle which most of the public sector bodies uh, comes up uh, and as you have uh, listened on various conversations, that that is a bottleneck. The way we are working through, and in fact, we are very successful in getting over 10 odd councils to have a direct award call off is through LHC um, and that, uh, and many of them are through the swapper. Um, and they have, possibility of using the NH2 framework where we are on their contractor list and which will be and which enables them to provide direct award through certain processes that maybe a film can elaborate at a later stage. But uh, we are able to use this OJU compliance best value demonstrative procurement tool to reduce that cost and the time of the procurement. And it has been, and most of the councils uh, have their first modular project and they have engaged us through this. So it's not that it had, they have used it before, but they're the first time they've used it. So it's, it's so as, as a stages, uh, various councils, various public bodies have gone through in a various stages. So the left two sides shows from the concept to planning and then procurement. For Bromley, we started with concept planning and then procurement at the same time. But our most best route of engagement is here. So start early where your concept stage, we can definitely help, we can engage with you, deliver that initial feasibility massing. 
then possibly is the procurement stage where you can overcome the procurement issues, work with your procurement bodies, procurement departments and other um, departments. Once you sort out the procurement, then we can engage with you on the PCAC strategy, which means we on the PCAC agreement, which is pre-construction service agreement, which thereby will enable you to take from RIBA stage two to RIBA stage four up to the planning. And once planning is approved, we now engage with the JCT design and build, which means from actual fabrication to completions. So this is the way we most of our um, clients have been engaged with, uh, but the step two, the procurement aspect is where uh, LHC and SWAPA will be helpful. Uh, another thing, if you want to learn more about the Bristol Hope Prize, and uh, I can see that the author of this particular project, uh, his publication is also on the attendees list. So thank you for joining. So it's a fantastic um, uh, publications capturing all the, the difficulties and recommendations. Uh, I've just mentioned a couple of them. That's a, that's a publication which you can get access to. Um, either you can write to me or to Phil or to uh, Bridget, uh, BHF to get a copy of that. It is a worthwhile read to go through from procurement issues to planning to everything. It's a well-captured document of what's the learning of this project. Um, I'm not going through because of lack of time, So, but these are all that just the early education aspect is important, get early engaged, get to your um, sustainability angle, get to your project brief right. It is a two-way dialogue and then start with the procurement process and maintain the quality. And we will be able to, and whoever is your principal contractor will be able to deliver that social value angle, which is very important. So yeah, thank you. Hopefully I've, I've got in time, sorry, a bit extended time. No, thanks, Stefan. So you, you probably, to be fair, you probably helped me out so I can kind of uh, reduce my time. And uh, I think my slides are probably a bit more boring than uh, <laughs> than, 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 than you lost. So I think people will probably appreciate it anyway. But no, thank you. Thank you all. Um, and you kind of make one good point, uh, Stefanzi, which I'm going to kind of touch on a bit more later, is, is, is early engagement. That really is that really is the key. Um, certainly is from from my perspective, from a, from a procurement perspective. But I'll, I'll touch on a bit more of that um, in, in a short while. Um, yeah, if you can un unshare your screen, the answer, then I'll share. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Ah, okay. Um, but hopefully. Um, right, okay. Uh, can, uh, can everybody see that? Um, right. Um, so fact, I think one of the just very quickly, just one of the questions um, was was around what is a DPS. So just very quickly, um, a, a DPS. Or if I'm comparing a DPS and a framework, uh, a framework is is very rigid. It's 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 kind of it's it's set for four years. There's there's one opportunity to to apply, uh, and then you have to wait the four years. To kind of reapply again, if that, if that makes sense. So, whereas a DPS, it can be open for as long as you want it to. So it can be open for longer than four years, um, and suppliers can apply any time. Is the real is the real benefit for for both obviously suppliers and for clients. Um, and I think I think particularly with with MMC and you know the emerging market that it is, I think it's it's great to have that flexibility for for suppliers to to apply any time. Um, particularly for kind of smaller um, SMEs, I think it's I think it's really beneficial. Um, so if I yeah, so um, so we're all aware of the advantages of, of MMC in terms of quality, compliance, uh, sustainability, speed, reduced costs, um, and MMC offers an opportunity to tackle many of the challenges the industry faces with regards to to quality, skill shortages, and and the increasing gap between housing supply and demand. And, and there's undoubted government support to embrace MMC to, to build new homes at pace while maintaining the highest levels of, of quality assurance. Uh, this is set against the backdrop of the UK needing to build up to 300,000 new homes per year, uh, a target which is frequently missed. So the construction playbook was, was launched by the government at the end of last year, where the adoption of MMC is encouraged for faster delivery of projects and at scale. 
The proposed changes in the playbook are greatly needed. A drive for adoption of MMC will ensure that the UK will see more investment in training and apprenticeships, driving forward innovation, boosting productivity, uh, and focusing on value for money in public sector developments. Well, sorry to yes. butt in there, but we can't see your slides. Oh, have I? A few seconds. It must be the, I must have clicked the wrong. Uh, there we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Perfect. Sorry, apologies. Um, so, so there, there are a number of barriers to, to adoption um, and risks that need to be understood if if MMC is to become as common as more traditional methods. Um, and it's likely that public procurement in the UK has been contributing to the blockage of, of MMC. Uh, the, procurement rule, the procurement rule should foster competition, which in turn should promote innovative and efficient solutions. Uh, but there are now clear signs from, from procurement practice that this is changing and that MMC is slowly moving into the mainstream. Um, so I'll touch on some of the kind of procurement related barriers that I see um, and that includes supply chain resilience, uh, procurement classification, specifications, cost, innovation um, and also just touch on very briefly about a few others, um, investment difficulties, insurances uh, and, and cash flow. And then I'll move on just briefly around what the government are, are proposing in terms of the construction playbook and, and the procurement green paper. Um, and how SWPA can help remove remove these barriers with, with our procurement solutions. So poor supply chain resilience can affect profitability uh, and, fund, and fundability of projects. Uh, in this regard, a fairly big barrier to the uptake of MMC is seen to relate to its lack of well-established supply chains. Recognising this was a major issue, LHC and SWPA launched the first iteration of their offsite construction and new homes framework, NH1, back in 2015-2016, uh, and that was followed up four years later with, with NH2. Um, so these frameworks focus on alliancing, uh, and with the FAC1, the framework alliancing contract, this promotes an, uh, promotes an overarching theme which seeks to align objectives and interests. These procurement solutions promote a joint up approach to achieving supply chain resilience. So alliancing is, is one way of achieving supply chain resilience. However, MMC manufacturing products become more, as they become more specialized, for example, because of greater focus on data accumulation during the construction and operational phases, we could see greater sophistication and, and savvy operators within the supply chain, meaning that alignment of interests may not always be possible. Um, here, commercial MMC developments could see our traditional JCT and NC subcontracts replaced with a, you know, with a hybrid contract that, that places greater emphasis on compatibility and repeat use of components. This would mean MMC manufacturers can keep building quickly without coming up with bespoke solutions every time. A resilient supply chain in this context could mean a set of well-negotiated commercial subcontracts uh, instead of some emails or an order form with, with a miscellaneous contract. Uh, so public bodies until now have struggled to determine whether a contract for development of MMC housing would constitute either a supply or works contract for the purposes of, of the public uh, contracts regulations. Uh, and as you can see, they, they both have vastly different thresholds. Um, so if it's, a, if it's a service type contract, the threshold is, is you know, 190,000, whereas a works contract is 4.7 million. So for those of you who don't know, it depends on what where that sits um that has that's the that's the minimum threshold um so if it's a works contract anything over 4.7 million has to be advertised um what wasn't owed you is now um find a tender service so that goes out to um uh, to kind of the country uh, to companies across europe um to, to bid on um on those work packages um so if it if the subject matter relates to the purchase of the components, the project may need to be put out to tender as a supply contract. And on the other hand, if the supplier is expected to install the components as, it, as units, uh, the procurement may need to be carried out as a works contract. But actually, in reality, the, the classification of the contract is, is pretty much unlikely to spark a legal challenge, but the, the, threat, the threat is there. 
Uh, specifications. So legally, when we're drafting specifications uh, for the preferred solution, the contracting authority should not draft too narrowly or widely in order to rule out or unduly favour any potential workable solution which may meet uh, its particular needs. So not knowing how to draft specifications for, for a new type of solution or to draft them wide enough as to not inadvertently discriminate against that new type of solution may have been a barrier against the adoption of MMC in public procurement. The Construction Innovation Hub identified defining the need as one of the biggest obstacles to the growth of MMC solutions. But this is now changing with the creation of frameworks and dynamic purchasing systems, which, which public bodies can opt in and effectively provide them with, with ready-made solutions. Cost, I won't touch on this too much, as I'm sure people are fully aware of, of, of the issues and barriers around costs, but, but MMC solutions often suffer as a result of making costs the primary focus on, on a procurement. The upfront costs are generally uh, higher than, than traditional build. However, there are a number of, of major benefits which modular brings, including delivery speed, um, sustainability, uh, and reduced labor costs. And depending on how the evaluation is carried out, modular solutions may find themselves at a disadvantage at the evaluation stage. So procurement authorities need to structure the cost evaluation through the whole life running costs. Um, procurement need to move away from traditional transactional risk averse approaches to recognize the value in MMC. And whole life cost is permitted under the public contract regulations as a means of carrying out financial appraisal of tenders. Um, and through engagement, public bodies might be persuaded to include award, award criteria which rewards some of the benefits of MMC uh, that it has to offer, such as shorter lead times and, and more sustainable solutions. Innovation. So the imperative to innovate in construction has never been greater. Uh, productivity and sustainability issues, including net zero carbon, need to be addressed and resilience uh, design into our buildings. MMC exists to help facilitate this change, but business as usual procurement methods are a frequent barrier to its adoption, particularly for SMEs. Too often it's presumed that if common best practice is followed then the best outcome is achieved, the results are often compliant, inflexible, tried and tested procurement that leaves no room for innovation. One of the changes that can be made to nurture innovation, deliver improved outcomes and removing barriers is by early supply chain involvement. There is a lack of visibility for the, for the off-site supply chain, and this needs to be addressed and aligned with traditional uh, existing pre-qualification tools in the construction industry. Uh, I just want to kind of touch on uh, a few others that are not specifically procurement related, but, um, but funders find it difficult to invest um, in, in, in this kind of production model without visibility of future demand. Uh, the, the public said there was a key role to play in overcoming this by establishing procurement and joint venture models that will help stimulate demand. These would share risk in a collaborative working environment. Programs would cover the longer term rather than being one-off pilots or small-scale developments. The transparency of capital and operational costs are key, including greater cost information and performance data, especially when a client will ask how the cost compares with more traditional methods. Uh, bespoke insurance measures such as such as BOPAS, um, which the guys have kind of mentioned, are also complemented by existing warranty providers, including NHBC. However, we still need to move towards a position where warranties, insurance and, and general mortgage ability become as common and accessible for MMC as they are for traditional building methods. Currently, warranty providers use different standards for their assessment of homes, making it difficult to know what the homes have been tested for. So again, greater collaboration and transparency in technical assessment and validation across the market will ensure we have consistency of approach and can drive a more unified quality and standard led approach to innovation. Uh, and finally, we have, um, cash flow security and insolvency. So as many uh, MMC companies are small or medium sized enterprises, there are issues around cash flow and security while the production, while the production model often require significant upfront payments. Clients are understandably nervous about these, uh, fostering a risk-averse attitude to MMC. There are also significant concerns around bespoke products and risks associated with, with insolvency, both during construction or in the future. 
However, these emphasis how this emphasizes how important it is for local authorities, developers, registered providers, and, and MMC specialists to collaborate in joint ventures and alignment alliance agreements that, if robustly established, will go some way to addressing the challenges faced across the industry and improve house building growth in the UK. The risk has focused attention on, on standardization and development of potential MMC design guides. Um, so we've, we've touched on some of the ways in which um, obstacles can be eradicated, but what, you know, what other measures are in place to remove these um, and what procurement solutions are available? So the government uh, has, within the past 12 months, introduced the construction playbook and the, and the procurement green paper, which I'm sure many of you have, have read. Um, I just want to touch on, on these documents very briefly as we are kind of tight for time, but I thought it'd be good just to go over some of the key points which should help to break down some of the barriers to adoption. So the government are very positive about MMC and often talks about the role it can play. So we need to look at, for, we need to look for the opportunities within their agenda. So in terms of the green paper, the government intends to legislate, legislate to require contracting authorities to have regard to the government's strategic priorities for public procurement and a new national policy statement. So some of those priorities are uh, around publishing pipelines, um, benchmark and performance, uh, talks about diversity, innovation, resilience, um, risk allocation. So risk allocation should be subject to scrutiny prior to going to market uh, with meaningful market engagements. Uh, and resolution planning, so suppliers of critical contracts this, to the public sector should provide corporate resolution planning information so that contracting authorities prepared for any risk to the continuity of service delivery posed by insolvency. Uh, then it talks about the introduction of, of the new competitive flexible procedure. Um, this will provide greater flexibility for commercial teams to design their own procurement procedure to fit around their procurement uh, and will encourage innovation and allow them to engage with the market more effectively and proactively. Uh, and, and effective contract management, so the government propose legislating to further tackle payment delays in public sector supply chains and give small businesses, charities and social enterprises deep in the supply chain better access to contracting authorities to expose payment delays. And again, the construction playbook was introduced at the back end of last year. Um, as you can see, it sets out a number of specific targets and opportunities, including favoring long-term contracting, standardized designs, driving innovation, improving risk management, taking strides towards net zero commitments, social value, all of which can help tackle barriers to the adoption of MMC. So what can, what can SWPA offer to, to remove some of these barriers um, we have talked about and, and align itself to the, to the playbook and the green paper? So we currently have two off-site MMC procurement solutions, which I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, both, of these, both of these solutions have their own kind of presentation packs, which, uh, which probably take about half an hour each. So I'll, I'll, I'll condense them down so I can, I can kind of talk, to, talk about the main elements and, and, and in relation to the barriers that we've discussed and, and what benefits they deliver. So buyers generally do not know where to start with MMC. I think that's part of the, part of the problem. Um, suppliers can't get through the procurement barriers to show off their products. And on top of that, society needs affordable, high quality, low carbon homes at pace. So as previously mentioned, there are numerous blockers currently to the adoption of MMC, many around the unknown risks and how to integrate new data to make solid decisions and build new business cases. Uh, at the moment, the solution is to instruct the consultants to advise on, on the best options. Construction professionals, professionals then address viability and look to procure. This is, this is obviously an, an expensive and long process. And this is exactly what our low carbon offsite housing DPS helps to eliminate. Um, and in, conjunc in conjunction with uh, the Construction Modern Methods CMM digital toolkit, uh, it helps drive innovation and helps to facilitate outcome-led procurement. So basically it allows uh, buyers to optioneer against a database of, of modular housing developers to understand which construction systems, organizations and performance options will best suit the needs of a site and the buyer. It's also, also intended to support innovation by allowing modular companies to bring their solution to the table 
through a robust and quality assured database in a way that relying on individual knowledge and experience might otherwise lean towards familiar options. This tool makes a full spectrum of, of products visible and accessible to buyers, help, helping narrow down the field to a number of possible options based on local policy and project specific criteria. One of the main reasons behind the DPS alongside the toolkit um, was to, to give support to, to small local developing suppliers of MMC an opportunity to be in the shop window for public sector clients. So suppliers apply for the DPS as, uh, as normal. They'll download, complete the application process. Suppliers are then assessed and evaluated based on financial, technical uh, criteria. Um, once they pass that selection, um, it's then a mandatory requirement for them to input their, their off-site MMC solution into the toolkit. So the, the toolkit includes KPIs like uh, the number of units um, they can deliver, the type of systems, whether it's panelized, volumetric, whether they offer turnkey, um, the dwelling type, energy efficiency outcomes, the regions they want to work in, the warranties and certifications they hold, uh, social value and, and lots more. Uh, so once they complete that, um, they're then awarded a place on the, on the DPS. Um, contractors can apply, um, but the key requirement is that they have to partner with an MMC supplier at the point of application. Uh, and because this is a DPS, it offers a huge flexibility as it's always open to applicants. So public sector clients will then hopefully have a scheme that they'll, in, they'll input their site requirements into the toolkit. Um, so the number of units, uh, the energy efficiency outcomes, warranties, et cetera, et cetera. The toolkit will then give the client a list of approved suppliers who meet those specific needs. Um, the client can then use that information for, for a business case, for example, um, or, or move directly forward to, to a call offer and a mini competition. Uh, through the DPS um, and with those automatically selected suppliers based on you know, the client's requirements. The toolkit allows clients to understand the market before engaging in a procurement process, which I think is really crucial. Um, this ultimately gives the client confidence that there is a solution within the marketplace before going out to tender. And the data in the toolkit is, is constantly evolving as well as suppliers improve their products through uh, productivity gains, energy efficiency, that sort of thing. It's very dynamic and, and the perfect kind of sidekick to, to, to a dynamic purchasing system. So quickly, just some of the benefits for, for clients and suppliers on how this procurement vehicle can help remove those barriers we discussed earlier. So the benefits for, for clients, so it allows them to get to grips with a rapidly evolving and changing MMC marketplace. It provides crucial data on key metrics like time scales, green credentials, performance, site suitability, uh, and also gives some idea of cost versus traditional build, which I think um, people will be keen to kind of know a bit more about. Um, it's obviously a, legal, a legally compliant procurement solution that offers choice and confidence in suppliers, uh, robust quality assured data, so we, we do all the research for you. As I mentioned, it's a facility's true outcome-led procurement, allowing the client to procure against the strategic needs which matter to them. Uh, it's obviously an efficient procurement process, and, and like I've said, there's no obligation to, to carry out a call off. Uh, and then just some of the benefits for, for suppliers, um, they can offer a supply only a full turnkey solution. They're in the shop window more frequently, which is always a, a problem, in, in, even in my experience of working for, uh, for for the NHS, um, you know, these, these smaller emerging companies don't tend to, to get the opportunity to, to do much work in the public sector. Um, so it increases the reach for all suppliers and contractors. So we, we basically become your sales team. It aligns the contractor and supplier and their systems to buyers who are looking for that specific system. So no more high performance systems being knocked out on price. Uh, it provides a procurement solution so that MMC contractors and suppliers can actually work with the public sector, as I've mentioned. Um, and as a, and as a system improves in performance, cost, data, we, up, we update your metrics uh, and opportunities to meet and operate within new partnership and networks, helping to create a pathway for SMEs. So the construction playbook acknowledges the need to standardize and outline how it wants government and industry to work together on public uh, projects. 
One of the key measures outlined is the encouragement of standardised design to harmonise and rationalise builds. But this is likely to prove another challenge as most manufacturers have invested heavily in their intellectual property and products. While they may be reluctant to share knowledge progress towards a common product platform, mass customization is considered a necessity. Adopting a more manufacturing-led approach to public works, projects, and programs should improve productivity and deliver, and deliver better value for money for our public sector clients. This then leads me on to our, our NH2 framework and a collaborative volume aggregated mini competition we're carrying out and facilitating on behalf of Magna uh, Housing and Wiltshire Council. So the idea behind this project, it brings together a pipeline of two experienced uh, MMC clients who have already procured MMC through our, through our frameworks. Uh, as, as I've said, SWPA are facilitating the mini competition on behalf of the clients and we're also working very closely with, with Taylor Lewis, who have been appointed by our clients via our offsite project integrated framework. And they're putting together the standard house types and specification, which will sit alongside the procurement documents. Um, so, so what are the core elements of the cluster and, and the benefits to clients and suppliers? So it's, it's coming off an established framework. It's, um, we have established manufacturers and suppliers on that framework. Um, better pricing through aggregation and standardization. So greater economies of scale potentially. Um, it lowers the cost of operations as a result of reduced number of buying events. So less purchase orders, less invoices, less tendering. Um, and through standardization leads to inherent efficiencies in the buying process. It also offers cost certainty and customization options with fixed pricing. Offers consistent quality, reduced waste, um, combined design portfolio and specification, as I said, experienced clients. And we're looking at a current pipeline of around a thousand homes across a four year period. I'll skip past this slide because I know we're, I've just looked at the time, which we're a little bit tight for, so I apologize, Laura, but uh, um, yeah, if I can hand over to you now, Laura, and um, so should Laura will go um, maybe touch on the cluster work a little bit and talk about their, the, the MMC journey from a, from a client's perspective. Are we seeing that? Yes, I can see that, Laura, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, my, um, my role as residential development manager at, at Wiltshire Council is to bring forward our affordable housing development program. And um, I'm gonna try really hard not to make this a procurement bashing <laughs> session because my experience of working with procurement was just painful so we would have to go to procurement for you know every single piece of tendering whether that was just to procure a um, an architect to do some basic proving layouts or whether that was going out to tender and I felt like we were getting a lot of things we couldn't do but very little things that we could do and um, we um, yeah so we we started this journey out of um difficulties of trying to actually drive our program forward and finding ourselves being caught up like lots of people have said today in those public procurement thresholds those public pro procurement rules and as a local authority um, you know we are very risk averse and it was very difficult to enable our procurement department to see that we needed to sometimes be a little bit more innovative so um, we um, if we go back to 2020 February, these were the challenges that presented us at the time. And obviously things have moved on. Nobody knew what was going to come at this point, but these are the challenges that we we were facing, that we had just been given a, um, an objective to deliver a thousand new homes. Um, as a council, we had a drive for zero carbon. We were one of those early adopters of the climate emergency and declared that climate emergency quite early. Um, we were still actually quite new to the development world. We um, had delivered 150 affordable homes in the previous years, um, but, but we were still quite new. This, you know, what we had built and how we had built them was very traditional, and um, we had just followed, you know, a traditional path. 
but we were given this opportunity at the end of that phase when we thought things would come to an end to actually say now the HRA borrowing cap had 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 been removed and as a council we wanted to actually fill the gaps that weren't being filled by our RP partners, um, building in the rural locations, building homes that meet us, our sort of more corporate needs and objectives around building homes for learning disability clients for people with high adaptive, high adapted needs. So we were trying to fill those gaps in the market. Um, but we were obviously then facing the difficulties with public procurement rules, but not only that, an extensive amount of internal approval processes to actually deliver our projects and one of the biggest challenges was that we needed to deliver at speed even though we'd only just been set the target to deliver a thousand new homes it's the the need to actually see something tangible and that's um you know as we all know it can take sometimes the best part of 18 months sometimes to two years to get from a piece of land to being on site just through the design process, the planning process. So we needed to find a solution that enabled us to move things just a little bit quicker. So um, jumping into where we ended up um, as a kind of quite military based um, county, we um, were invited to a meeting actually with Roll Along through some MOD colleagues that we had um, been working with and visited the factory to see how the modular solution worked. We had spent quite a lot of time before this investigating and researching, trying to understand um, what we wanted to deliver as our affordable housing. We had been given a sort of six month um, period between the end of our previous construction program and starting the new construction program where we spent a lot of time researching passive house, zero carbon, embodied carbon to try and understand what it was that we wanted to deliver. So when we visited Roll Along, we believed that our route was that we needed to find a way to deliver passive house properties throughout Wiltshire. Um, but, but actually in seeing what they were delivering for Magna, we were then introduced to Magna, um, who were already or had already spent quite a lot of time developing a product and developing a design that was being manufactured by Roll Along. And for us, that was one of our big, the biggest sort of incentives was was that we were looking at um, a, a traditional home, a home that was housing led it was led by the clients it wasn't led necessarily by well, what works from a manufacturing perspective it's what works from a, a home how will this work as a home so we continued conversations with Swepper and then internally with our procurement team to try and get them on board with this concept of doing a direct award um, and having to prove that the competition had been achieved through those previous procurement processes so from setting up the NH2 framework to then Magna undertaking their own mini competition and then us being able to direct award on the back of that mini competition that had taken place by Magna so um, all of those steps bearing in mind we were in the middle of the pandemic so things probably took a little bit longer than they would have normally we then got to the point in September where we got the approval internally that we could actually take the approach of a direct award and we then went through the processes Phil sort of alluded to of the offsite project integrator role and this role was essential for us and I think for anybody who's new to the MMC world because it brings um, the expertise of having worked in an MMC world and a traditional world and it pulls that information together and it helps us as clients understand it but it also helps join up the groundwork contractor with the um, MMC provider if they are two different um, suppliers. So we went through then a period of um, agreeing the employer's requirements and the contractor proposals and got our modules uh, running through the factory in May this year. And that to you might sound like a long time, 15 months to get from, from conversation starting to modules being manufactured, but actually from a local authority perspective, that felt like quite quick. Um, and we were able to, um, you know, really evidence the benefits of a direct award for us because 
we are quite small fish in terms of a developing authority. We um, can't get numbers, big numbers that can help drive down some of those efficiencies. So for us to be able to piggyback onto the back of the work that Magna had done and be able to use all of that knowledge and expertise that they had spent years building up, it meant that it saved all of that research cost, all of the design cost and time resources of going through our own mini competition or even full, um, you know, full tender. And I've just tried to evidence how I think that would have panned out had we not been able to direct award and had we not had Swepper available to help us through that process. And very high level, I think that it would have put at least six months onto that process for us without having Swepper there to, to help bridge those gaps and help with those conversations that we were having with our procurement team. Um, so from our perspective, I think the benefits of the framework and the way that we have been able to pilot um, this MMC approach was that we, the competition process that had already been completed, we, we didn't have to complete that again. We didn't have to go through um, the, the actual competition, the mini competition itself, we were able to direct award. We actually had Southwest Procurement Alliance on hand for us speaking to our procurement team to explain the process to them so that they could get on board and, and sort of join us on the journey. And that was a huge, a huge benefit. And um, I think the speed at which we were able to achieve that without the framework, it just it just wouldn't have happened. Had we been a brand new client walking into the MMC world with no design, no product, no idea of what we wanted to achieve, um, it would have definitely taken much longer and, and definitely a lot more money from the local authority to actually get from A to B. So um, again, Phil kind of touched on this, the cluster. So we are working at the moment with Magna. Um, building a cluster of clients to actually enable us. We are very similar in terms of Magna and Wiltshire Council. We both own around 5,000 5, to 6,000 units. Um, we are very driven on the sustainability and the um, energy efficiency agenda, the zero carbon agenda. We want to keep evolving and, and improving. And um, for us to be able to share that knowledge and experience and to actually work together and bounce ideas off each other has been hugely beneficial for us as a relatively new um, authority developing, but also financially, we're able to share some of those costs. We're also now looking at aggregating all of our demand into one um, tender, which we're, is due to go out in the next couple of weeks, which will enable us to do a mini competition to evidence to our procurement team that we have now We've proven that MMC is the way forward for us. We've been to the factory, we've seen the levels of quality, and we can see that this is the drive and the way that we want to, to go forward with all of our new affordable housing. Um, and in doing that, we now you know, have to go through our own mini competition to prove to our procurement team that we have tested the market fully and that we have um, you know, made sure that we are working um, as efficiently and effectively as possible with the right manufacturer. So that's our next steps. Laura, apologies. This is I don't, this is this is my fault as much as anybody else's. This, how many slides have you got left? You know, that's it. No, that's oh, it. I'm okay. done. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's <laughs> so it, yeah, then. that was it. Um, Perfect. Thank you. All good. <laughs> thank you very much, Laura. Yeah, thank God. Kind of didn't want to kind of speed you up, but um, um, probably my fault for for talking too long. But um, no, thank you very much for that. Um, Am I, I still sharing? Uh, yes, I've got your, your desktop, yeah. Hang on. Stop share. There we go. That's better. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a couple more slides, but I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll send everybody the, or Emily will send everybody the, the slide packs, um, the contact details for everybody, um, and also information around the NH2 framework and the DPS. Um, yeah, apologies, we're, we're kind of short for time. Like I said, there's, there's literally only a couple of slides left. So um, if anybody's got any questions, um, 
on on those slides or, or any of the slides um, for any of our speakers, then please please get in touch with us directly. I know there's a couple questions in here. One of them is probably quite easy to answer, Laura. It's what is a HRA and why is it important? Is it, that's something you can answer very too, relatively yeah, briefly. Yeah, it's the housing revenue account. So it's the all of the money that comes in through our rents goes into a housing revenue account. And there used to be a cap on how much of that could be spent. And the cap was removed, which then enables us to borrow against our housing revenue account finance. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think the other, the, the final question probably might, I don't know how quickly you can answer this one, but why did Wiltshire decide to use SWPA uh, as opposed to uh, to other frameworks? Um, did you have to go through a selection exercise? No, we didn't go through a selection exercise. We um, yeah, as um, Wiltshire Council have a number of frameworks that are already in place, and this is um, and this was one of them. So we were able to use it quite quite easily without having to go through too much more pain. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Um, but I think. Um... I think that's all the questions. I think luckily we've all the, the the panel have been really, really, really good in kind of answering the questions as we've been going along. So that's been that's been really useful seeing we've gone past five o'clock now. But um yeah, thank you everybody for your time. Thank you to the speakers for for your time and effort. We we really appreciate it. Um and like I said, everybody that's, that's attended, um thanks for your time and we'll we'll send out the contact details and the, and the slide packs for you. And um yeah, please get in touch with us if you've got any questions directly for for, for anybody and any of our speakers. So yeah, thank you and um, apologies again that we got